Hello and welcome to the Los Angeles Greek Film Festival event series. I'm Araceli Lemos, a member of the team who is organizing these online live events. This is our 14th edition, but our first online one. It's been going very well so far and more and more people are tuning in and a lot of people are watching the films and we're very happy about that. Um, I, would like to let to, I would like to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded. The audience is not visible or audible, only our guests. And the video will be posted at a later time on our social media and our website. So I'm happy to be introducing today's masterclass with the chairman and CEO of Paramount Picture, Jim Janopoulos. Hello, Mr. Janopoulos. Hi, Thank you. Thank you, Arasana. Very much for being here with us. Um, to start the event, I would like to introduce also today's moderator, Agedeki Yanakopoulos. Hello, Angeliki. Hi. Angeliki is the co-founder of the LA Greek Film Festival. Today, uh, together with Ersi Danu, they founded it 14 years ago. She has worked in theater, film, and TV for the last 36 years as an actor, writer, director. But what she loves the most is producing, and her latest project has, was just sold to Ablin Partners with Kate Taylor attached direct. Congrats, Angeliki. And again, Ki, I'll turn it off to you. Uh, over to you, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Sarasali. Welcome, everyone from the US, Greece, and everywhere else. Uh, we're very happy that you're joining us this morning. Um, I would like, and it's my honor, to introduce uh, Mr. Giannopoulos, who is a chairman and CEO of Paramount Studios Films in uh, film and television operations worldwide, including production, marketing, distribution, and all other facets. He is a first-generation Greek-American. Mr. Giannopoulos has been a leading figure in the global entertainment industry for more than 30 years. Previously, he served as a chairman and CEO of Fox Film Entertainment, overseeing 20th Century Fox, Fox Searchlight Pictures, Fox International Productions, and 20th Century Fox Animation, Blue Sky Studios. He began his career as an attorney specializing in entertainment law. Hi, Jim. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us. And I have a, a whole bunch of questions here to ask you and, and everyone can get to know you so much better. Um, um, so the first one that I like to ask is, um, you know, how, how did it begin? How did you, your path took you from law school to the entertainment world? Um, well, you know, my, uh, my love of movies started very young. Um, my grandfather um, and my father, but mostly my grandfather, um, would want to spend time with me. And one way he did it was to take me to the movies on the weekends. Um, and it also for him, he, his Greek, his English wasn't very good. Um, so the good news for me, well, he wasn't very selective about what movies we saw. So I saw R-rated movies at eight and 10 years old, which was another kind of influence. But what was great about that was he always wanted me to translate during the movie. So, tile, tile, tipe. And so I'd have to translate and then people around us would get upset. But anyway, we had a great time and, and I developed early on a very deep love for, for movies and for television uh, and for, and for uh, music. But in any case, I, uh, I decided I was in bands and, and playing a lot in high school and I realized I didn't have the skills or talent to be a great blues musician, so I better figure out how to get an education if I wanted to be a part of the entertainment business. Um, and so I went to law school, as you said, and uh, I came out and uh, again, because of my roots in, in music, I got a job working for an organization called ASCAP, which dealt with a lot of songwriters and publishers and record companies, but mostly with their agents and lawyers and representatives. And along came this thing called video. And uh, the studios realized that they didn't have the music rights they needed. So they said, well, who knows all these people and can negotiate all these things? And we've got to find some young lawyer that I said, I, you know, I know these guys. That's how I got in. And uh, the rest was one foot in front of the other. You know, when people ask, I, I, I say, I. Uh, 
I work my ass off in between lucky breaks and great mentors. Um, and so that turned into um, uh, financing movies for originally for video and pay television. And then um, I was very involved on the international side of the business for many years, setting up all of the international operations for Columbia Pictures. And one thing led to another. And as the, more, as the international business became more important, my skill set was more interesting and more desirable. Um, and eventually, I uh, was made chairman of Fox. Um, initially, a, a co-chairman, and then, uh, you know, on my own uh, for the last years I was at Fox. Um, yeah, so that was the journey um, in short form. I think it was just, uh, as I said, you know, people who took an interest, mentored me, gave me opportunities, a little bit of luck, um, and the very interesting technological transitions in the business, which allowed me to become part of the creative part um, through my, you know, you know involvement um, with the business side. Right, right. So, you know, obviously running some of the biggest studios in Hollywood and, and pretty much, you know, well all over the world, what do you think, what was your biggest risk that you took in your career, in your opinion, you know? the biggest risk that you feel you took? Well, you know, every time you make a movie, it's a risk, no matter how obvious or likely the outcome and whoever you're working with. Um, I still think the biggest risk was Avatar. We, we look at it now and say, mm. you know, it seems so obvious. Um, I knew Jim Cameron really well for many years, even going back to Titanic um, at Fox and actually going back to Terminator 2 when I, was uh, briefly at a at a uh, independent company called Carol Co where we made Terminator 2 but anyway yeah Jim was the well regarded as the perhaps the greatest director working um, but he had this crazy idea and he had actually shown it to me many years before um, as a treatment um, wow. about this guy who transforms into an alien in order to relate to the culture and and I, you know, the story that we all know. Um, but he still teases me because I, I said, do they have to be blue with tails? <laughs> um, the tails part was the part he always teases me about. And it was, it was a total fantasy film right. with an incredibly big budget. And as much as I love and regard Jim, you know, many people remember Titanic and they, they you know, they know that it went over budget, but put it in perspective, Titanic had gone over budget by an amount greater than any movie had ever cost before, just the over budget part. Right. So we knew Jim because of who he is and, and um, even when his own compensation is at risk, he will not stop. So we knew that it would be um, risky both in creatively, will people relate to these blue people running around on a foreign planet speaking a made up language? Right, right. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I think that was a big risk. So was Life of Pi, you know, we made mm -hmm. Life of Pi and the big challenge in making Life of Pi was most of the movie, as you know, was a kid in a rowboat with a tiger. Well, how do you do that? Um, you know, we had one director as we tried to develop that movie because it was enormously costly to have to deal with a you know, young boy in a rowboat with a tiger. And one director said, well, I think I can do it practical. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, with a real tiger and a, and a kid. I said, well, you're going to need more than one kid if we do it that way. <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> exactly. So then, um, of course, Ang came and said, well, we need to do this. To do this right, we need to do it digitally, which was an extraordinary budget. It was a big bestseller. And Ang Lee, one of the great directors. Yes. But a massive budget. Um, so, you know, risk takes different forms. It's creative, it's financial, um, it's dependent on the quality of the people you're working with. Um, you know, but, but there's risk in every movie. There was a great risk in Slumdog Millionaire, which was a very modestly budgeted movie, but half the movie's in Hindi. It's a very dark story. Um, so, I, you know, you're always taking risk, but that's kind of the fun of it. And um, that's the nature of the business. 
right. uh, to take creative risk and try and manage the financial side so that you can take creative risk again the next time. Right, right. Well, you just mentioned some of the biggest movies in our industry and obviously all of them successes. Now, how, how about the one that got away? <laughs> yeah. How about the one that you said, should have gotten that one and we, we should have made that one? What would that one be? <laughs> well, it's interesting. I've gotten that question over the years. And what's interesting about it is it was a Greek themed movie. It was 300. <laughs> um, you know, my, my grandmother um, had come over from Thessaloniki and, um, and uh, she, uh, she was a, a classics professor. But anyway, my bedtime stories were not Dr. Seuss. My bedtime stories were Greek mythology and stories like Thermopylae. You know? Mine too. So, Mine too. Right? And so I knew <laughs> Molon Lave as a, as a child, as a baby. Yes. So now um, they make me chairman of Fox. And I go, okay. And, and this book had come out, Gates of Fire, which was the story of Thermopylae, but somewhat fictionalized. And all of a sudden there was all this interest in Thermopylae. And, and uh, so now I'm chairman. I go, okay, well, now I get to do it. So I, got some writers to write some stories and I did actually did a lot of research on the actual history and I'm in the thick of all of this and I find out that Warner Brothers um, has this graphic novel by Frank Miller um, and they're looking to make this movie The 300 and I was trying to get Ridley Scott after Gladiator mm. this would be the next be almost like a sequel to to Gladiator you know an ancient set um, film. Right. It was a great story. I'm pitching Ridley, trying to convince him, Jim, try to convince him, Cameron. And along comes uh, this, this graphic novel, which has Xerxes as this very strange looking character and right. all of it sort of a cartoon. And, and I couldn't relate to the notion of taking this proud moment of our history that I knew all my life and translating it into this edgy, cartoon-like, half-animated, well, animated version mm. um, with exaggerated characters and so forth. Mm. Uh, and I passed. And uh, Warner Brothers had blinked that I had this one moment when I could have stolen that movie. And I mm. said, no, we're developing a live action, real serious. Uh, and when I saw the film, I realized I'd made a huge mistake because some of the greatest lines in that, right. you know, uh, come back with your shields are on them. You know, they're, they're powerful lines that we know. But in today's world, especially for a young audience, some of them might have sounded corny. Mm. And the way that they made that film, and I give them a lot of credit, uh, brought it, made it relevant to to a modern pop culture audience. And my connection to the roots of that kept right. me from seeing it. So I learned that, you know, it was, a, I, it was a lesson that I knew but hadn't really come home, which is you don't make movies the way you like them, you make movies the way they like them. And, uh, and you need to be, take, you know, your passions and your, your past and your history into account but don't let it prevent you from seeing opportunities creatively um, that may be different. That's, that's a very good point. Um, just as a filmmaker myself is, you know, know your audience. You're making exactly movie for other people to see, not for you to, you know, um, just have satisfaction of what you think it's right. about or, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And actually um, it's an interesting point because when we did, um, you know, Life of Pi went through many cuts and many changes after uh, Ang had finished it. And we were at a research screening and he was resisting a change. There was you know, some length issues and some other issues. And we were talking outside after the, after the research screenings with the audience. And, uh, you know, we were having, a, he's a very elegant, very, Yes. lovely human being apart from his great talent so he's very mild mattered so you know uh i i said uh at one point he was resistant in his calm way and i said you know Ang, honestly it doesn't matter what you think and he mm. got 
And I said, you know what? It doesn't matter what I think. All that matters is what they think. And they're telling us this, and we need to listen to it. So I thought when I first said, it doesn't matter, I thought he was going to take my head off. It's calm. Right. Off. No, no, but it's hard but to it, hear but, that. But, as but, it, record, but it's I'm the sure. truth. And it's the truth. And, and uh, I've used that more many times. Yeah. Um, to yeah. try and get people out of because, you know, filmmakers will have lived the journey of a film sometimes for many, many years. And certainly the journey of making it days and days and nights and long hours and all of that and editing and post-production and all of that. And then they present it to the world and sometimes the world says, ah, it's okay, but this. And uh, they realize that that sequence that you're trying to cut took them three days. Yeah. You know, and so anyway, so. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. It kind of leads me on to my next question of how much autonomy do you think a director should have over his final cut? You know, and well, final cut is a very precious thing because what you know, when the when the average, I mean, we're talking about it varies, okay. And I, I would say that final cut is less important uh, from our point of view, and I know it's important for a director, but it's often less important than the relationship you have with the director. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had conversations with final cut directors, like Ridley Scott, Jim Cameron where they could have said, you know, sorry, you know, see you later, and yet they engage. Um, and then you get directors who especially, you know, at, at an earlier part in their career are trying to prove and show and, you know, have strong passions who don't have final cut and give you a harder, worse time than the guys who do, right. the people who do. So um, there's that. Um, but, you know, to make a movie for, I don't know, you know, hundred million dollars plus and then say, okay, just do whatever you think is right and we'll take it from there. That's difficult to do. And I think that's where it takes a while for someone to earn that privilege. And they earn it not only through uh, their success creatively and, and um, you know, financially in terms of audience reaction, but they earn it in terms of how collaborative they are, even if they have the ultimate say. You know, right. so um, there's every reason to resist it um, uh, from a studio point of view, because you're taking the studio's investment and putting it in the hands of a single individual. That's hard, um, especially an artist who says, this is what I want. I don't care if they don't like it. Right. Um, so it's 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 a precious, uh, right. it's limited in gift. But I, I think in, if you have the right relationship, it really doesn't matter. That's what I really want to say. Right, and a collaborative process. And, uh, yes, too. exactly. Um, yeah. But I but think we're what not going to put out something that a director is violently opposed to, right. you know, unless things go really badly. And I, I can't remember a situation. I can remember many situations where we had difficult conversations and choices and post-production editing choices, but I don't ever remember putting out something that a director didn't feel right. uh, ultimately okay with. Well, I think what you just said is, is huge, that you have to earn that title. You have to earn that final cut privilege, you know, and, and everything you just said, it leads up to that. So yeah. I, I like that. Um, so in your opinion, what's the difference between European and American studio films? Beyond, obviously, the big budgets. <laughs> um, what do you think well, the differences between well, those two are? Um, you know, uh, one of the, one of the um, mantras that we've always, that I've always, because I do spend a lot of time, apart from my upbringing, I spend a lot of time on the international side of the business. And, um, you know, I think uh, one of the things that we always go back to is um, think global, act local. Um, so, you know, we make movies that Hollywood has always, you know, when you go back to the origins of Hollywood, people say, why was Hollywood so, so much more successful than other big countries around the world? Uh, even though in the beginnings of, of the industry, you know, there were huge, you know, huge film businesses all over the world. Um, I think the big difference was that as um, 
as cinema developed in many parts of the world, it was rooted in the culture and the history, the literature, the stories, the legends of those countries, because that was what's most relatable mm -hmm. to those countries, right? Um, so they were evolutions from, from operas and stage plays and, right. you know, right. books. Um, in the U.S., by contrast, some people say, well, it didn't have really a culture. <laughs> I can argue about that. But what it did have, the audience was Chinese, Greek, Irish, you know, Italians, Russians. They were the melting pot that's the United States. Right. So from the very beginning of American cinema, of Hollywood cinema, it was meant to be multicultural, mm -hmm. whereas European cinema and global cinema, Asian cinema, international cinema, was really designed to appeal to the market in which it was made and to the audience sitting in those seats. And you can understand that naturally. Well, it's been a long time since that. Um, I think we're, we're, um there's no reason why uh, a film from any part of the world can. I mean, we just saw, you know, uh, an example of it in the in the last Parasite, which, you know, not only was massively successful, won the Academy Award, was in Korean. Okay, but those are, you know, those are rare instances where something comes up to that level of um, uniqueness. Right. Um, I think the biggest difference is um, what makes when sit, when film is made for primarily in a local audience, um, uh, it's the reason for its success or the or its raison d'être from the outset is what are the cultural, social, relatable ideas here that will make it successful here in Italy, in Germany, in Greece, mm. and wherever. Mm. And by definition, that makes it a little more difficult to be as relatable and successful in another culture. Doesn't mean it can't happen. But even if you look at the history of European cinema, with rare exceptions, Fran French films don't play in Germany, Italian films don't play in France. Why? Because they're made to be local. And that doesn't mean that local filmmakers can't make global films, but they have to set out to do that. Right. What are the themes that are going to be relatable globally? Um, or transform or you know or, or, or transport that film past throughout borders um, right. around the world and and that would be kind of like the beginning stages as a director as a writer thinking do i want my film to be released only domestically in my country or do i want my film to be seen all over the world and then understanding those that audience and making those adjustments. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you know, every filmmaker will say, I want my film to be seen everywhere in the world. I mean, you're <laughs> still saying the right thing. It, the question is, do I want my film to be powerfully relatable to my home country's audience and its themes and its ideas and its current politics or, you know, social issues or right. cultural issues and so forth? Right. Or, you know, and how will that resonate in, in, in another culture? Right, right. Well, um, I mean, do you think that people are just tired of uh, seeing or the audience are fatigued in all these big budget franchise films and, and they want the return of the small budget, you know, romantic comedies, um, unique stories or, or not? What, what do you I think, think audiences will always want um, unique stories. I think originality, story, character, ultimately that's what makes a successful movie. Um, big budget movies have to have that too, but they also provide spectacle. So you can stay home and watch it on a 40 inch screen, or you can go to the theater and watch it on a 40 foot screen. And that has its, um, that has its virtues too. Um, right. I don't think big franchises as a, as a genre are gonna go away for that reason, because the spectacle and the zeitgeist of a big tentpole movie um, will always have appeal. And, and the uniqueness of seeing it in that kind of setting where it's a single purpose thing, you're not distracted, Right. by you know your kid coming in or your dog barking or the phone ringing you're just there to see this magnificent spectacle 
So I don't think big budget spectacle movies will go away. Um, but as for big budget franchises, you know, they can wear out their welcome. I think the notion that you can do an endless number of sequels, we've known forever, um, doesn't work. The reason people do sequels of big budget successes is because it worked the first time. Obviously, the audience saw something they liked. Let's give it right. to them again. Yeah, well, let's give, them, give it to them again, but not the same thing. And if you can't evolve the, the film and its sequels, um, it becomes more difficult to keep it going. Right. So and the reason that things like Marvel movies works is there's a thousand characters in the universe and they move these in and those out and it has a built in play base. But, you know, you can you can still um, make a movie like Mission Impossible. We're now on we're now making the seventh and eighth back to back or a Bond movie. They've been doing those for 15 years. Right. right yeah. There is a built in audience, you know, it tends to be a little older, but it's still you know, it can be an eight, 800 to a billion dollars, you know, global success. As far as small stories, you know, we have, a, we have another saying, which is make it for someone or make it for everyone. Mm. So budget what do you mean by that? Well, what it means is the big budget movies, the global tent poles, if you're going to spend a hundred million, 150 million, 200 million dollars, on a movie, you better believe that that movie is going to be is going to appeal to a very broad spectrum domestically and globally and everywhere, and up and down, men, women, young, old. Right. Um, but you can be equally really successful by making a targeted movie that has a very defined audience that you know will be really po uh, uh, um, passionate about it. Right. Um, and relate very well to it. Right. Uh, just a couple of years ago when I got to, it was actually three years ago, when I got to Fox, uh, to Paramount, um, we did, there wasn't much of a slate. So we were looking for things to do. And a friend called with this movie called Book Club. Mm -hmm. And it was about, you know, some 70 plus year old women. Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it belonged to, they belonged to a book club. Right. And they started reading, you know, one of them, Jane Fonda. I mean, it was an incredible right. cast. Four of the most talented women. They, they all had been nominated or won Academy Awards. Yes. But it was a, you know, it was for 50-something women, right? Um, but they loved it. And this very modestly budgeted movie, you know, did $75 million. Did it really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I knew we had something when we were looking at the trailer and actually uh, she wasn't even on the film side. The head of television came in and she was, you know, I guess a 40 something woman. And she said, uh, oh, I want to, I'm going and I'm taking my mom. <laughs> I'm going and I'm taking my mom is all you need to hear. Um, yeah. So, uh, so there's an example and it was a, you know, it was a character based story about. It was lovely. You're never I, too I old love, to love to find romance, to, you know, take a different direction in your life. And that was a resonant theme. And there's a million examples of that, or many examples of that. So I, I still think, you know, but they have to be, you have to be clear about what your audience is, who your audience is, how deep that audience is, how authentic your story is to that audience. Yes. Um, you know, whether it's for a domestic African American audience or a, you know, a, you know, knucklehead young yeah. comedy for, yeah. you know, for stoners, whatever that right. is, or, or a drama of import and brains, mm. you got to know who your audience is. And then you have to know how you're going to tell them about it, how you're going to segment that audience and make sure that you arouse their passion for that particular film. and their interest in it, and then right. you have to adjust the budget right. to the answer to those questions. And but that's, that, you're bringing up a lot of, it's easy. <laughs> you, you're bringing up a lot of important points because a lot of the things you're saying is it makes the director and the writer to, to want to have more experience in production and also in marketing. Yes. In really understanding, you know, get knowledge in the business aspect of the entertainment business to really understand 
how to market your art because yes. we sometimes as artists get so involved in our art that we don't care about all the other things. We're like, oh, my producer is going to take care of that. My, you know, blah, blah, blah is going to take care of that. And as an artist, getting ready to give birth to something, from what you're saying, it just, we really need to have the knowledge about every aspect of the business. Well, they don't have to be, I, you know, yes, yeah, I, I, still, I still think that's an excellent point, and you're right. I don't know about every aspect of the business, but, I, but you, what you said about marketing, it really is, who is the audience? And they'll say, well, everybody, well, it's not every, not necessarily everyone. Um, no. But how are we going to message this? What are we going to tell them? You know, people say, if it takes you longer than a couple of sentences to tell me, obviously a pitch can be an hour or two hours. Um, <laughs> but if you can't tell me in a couple of sentences what the movie's about and how right. we're going to present it, it doesn't matter how good it is, we won't get anybody into the seats. So exactly. understanding the audience, the target audience, and the message, the ultimate message, the message of the movie and how you translate that message to a, to a distracted, busy, you know, you want to grab them and say, sit down so right. I can tell you about this movie, but you don't. You get 30 seconds or you get right. some little blip on uh, digital media, social media. So yeah, exactly. that, that part is very important to a filmmaker, especially if they want to get a green light. Right. Um, so we are so uh, missing going to the theater, Jim. I mean, it's, yeah, I it's just crazy. Uh, what do you think it's going to happen? How do you think the pandemic is going to affect? Obviously, theaters are closing left and right. I mean, yeah. what do you see the future being? Well, you know, I, um, I don't think I'm... Uh, you know, just a dreamer. Or I've been doing this uh, so long that, but, you know, as I, I said, I started, you know, I started in about the same time as video exploded around the world, here and around the world, right? Right. But I, you know, when you go back um, to that moment in time, just in the U.S. and in, internationally, sometimes there were one or two government television set, uh, stations before the grand, you know, the great evolution of of multi-channel television and satellites and all of that. Here in the US, there were three networks. And if you weren't sitting on your couch at eight o'clock at night, you didn't get to see your show. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden overnight, there were thousands of movies available for rent right down the street for $2. Right. It was a sea change in people's access to content, to music, to, I mean, to movies, to that, to music. Um, and then, all through the transition to pay television and satellites and multi-channel television and internet every time oh this is even from the beginning of television which was before me but the people studios are going to go broke the, the theaters especially who's going to go to a theater you have it all at home you know how many times people have said that for the past yeah, i've heard it yeah right but even yeah. you go back to television for 60 years people have been proclaiming the end of the theater the difference though this time, temporarily, I believe. Um, one of the things that attracted people know they can have a movie at home and now more movies and television and content of various kinds than ever before. But they always went to the theaters. Why? Because of its immediacy, its urgency. Did you wanna be the person who showed up at work or school and hadn't seen the big movie of the weekend? And also the spectacle but the communal aspect of being out of the home and being in a destination and being with other people. And that one thing, that communal sharing of the experience in one great big room is yeah. the thing that this pandemic has taken away. Yes. But if you think about it as, okay, all the other things are still there. The communal aspect has been taken away by people's concerns about the pandemic, right. well, the pandemic won't be here forever. So then the only issue is, and I have a lot of conversations with exhibitors, I mean, you know, it's very real. Um, we find it difficult to, um, to release a movie when, depending on the country around the world, but even just here, roughly half the people say, I'm not interested in going to the theater until there's a vaccine and this thing subsides. So 
it's difficult for and New York is closed. That's one of the biggest markets. Yeah. So um, the key now is for exhibitors to figure out, and it's not easy because they've been investing and borrowing money and building many theaters. And so they have to figure out how to get from here, and they're in not good shape to get from here to when this thing light, you know, eases up, right. which probably won't be until spring at the earliest. Um, and maybe summer. Um, and, uh, and that is really a, finan a matter of financial survival. You know, I just had a great friend of mine owns a lot of theaters in Sweden, and he just sent me an email this morning. He said, what do you think is going to happen? Like, I know. I, I <laughs> think, but you think theaters will be back? And I said, of course they will. And you just got to figure out how to get through this. All of us do. Yeah. You know? I mean, we had we had a slate of fifteen excellent movies, starting with you know a sequel to Quiet Place, which was much bigger than the original. Right. Research was showing it was going to open up to sixty or seventy million dollars the first weekend. Wow. And ten days out, we we canceled the release. Wow. And since then, all of our so are all these films shelved and just kind of waiting. Are shelved. Some are shelved, and the big ones, Mission Impossible, a, a Top Gun, Quiet Place. Yes, yes. Yeah, those, I'm, you know, when those movies just keep getting pushed back. It's not yeah. cheap to take a $150 million movie and sit on it for a year. Of course. There, there's that. Yeah. Um, and then because uh, since all of the 2020 movies moved into 21, and now look like they're going to move into the middle to back end of 21. So you have basically two years of movies in, call it six to nine months. What's going to happen is all these movies are going to crowd each other. And so when you look at a movie that would have been perfectly fine in a normal environment, and it's in an environment where every week you have a massive tentpole. Yeah. That's when you say, you know, Netflix called and wants to pay us and pay the talent and pay everybody well to take the movie off the release slate. Okay, in this circumstance and for that reason, okay. So you do it selectively, but you do it with the movies that would have a more difficult time having their full opportunity in what's going to be an incredibly crowded. That's the good news. It's the good news for audiences, and that's what I say to my friends in in the exhibition, in the theater section. Right. You're gonna be the ones when this thing lightens up and everybody's pushing their movies into one crowded period of time, when you will, you're telling me, no, I'm sorry, Jim, you know, but uh, you know, I got this new movie coming and you're out. <laughs> On that conversation then, anyway. Yeah, yeah, well, we hope all of this kind of comes back to normal. I think it, it will, I think it yeah. will. I remember just what you were saying about the intimacy in the theater. You know, Frances Fisher, she was, she played the mom in the Titanic. Oh, good she used, yes, she used to say, um, you know, in a theater, you walk in as strangers and you walk out as a community. Yeah. yeah and I true. love that. That is yeah. so, so true because you yeah. don't get that in our sitting on the couch watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but let's talk a little bit about these new rules with the Oscars um, and including, you know, diversity and, and yeah. kind of changing the rules around. And yeah, I know yeah. that you've been involved in, in, uh, yeah, in that yeah. whole process. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Um, they asked me, you know, there are various branches. I've been proud to be a, a governor of the academy now for, I don't know, 16 years. 15, right. 16 years. Right. Anyway, I, I, you know, I'm sitting among those talented people in the business, or some of the most talented people, directors and, and production designers and composers, and, um, but they're not business people. So they end up rooting me when it comes to stuff that has to do, among others, um, has to do industry facing. Um, uh, and uh, I uh, partnered on this task force because I, because, you know, I, I didn't want the academy, and I didn't think it would serve the academy to issue things, some edict from the mountain, so to speak. Uh, I said, these aren't tablets from the mountain. They need the industry to 
be engaged. Um, and it's very clear that um, this past due sense of inclusion and diversity in our industry, and particularly in this country, right. um, uh, is something that people have to address. And, and, and so the Academy wanted to be part of that. Uh, so um, yeah, so I helped craft um, uh, what are intended to be guidelines to say, look, there's a variety of ways that you can influence people's inclusion. Um, I wanted to put Greeks on it, but I didn't think they'd let me, and, you know, <laughs> Italian, Italians and Russians and everything. But the idea of being more open to the inclusion of, of diverse ideas, diverse uh, cultures, and uh, diverse points of view. Um, but at the same time, making it easier to say, okay, well, you know, this director isn't diverse, but over here, we're doing a mentoring program which, going, which is going to provide us with the next diverse director or, you know, uh, uh, other um, talent, you know, down the road. So um, it was designed to really to focus the industry on the issue and yet to make it possible for, to prevent films like um, Dunkirk from being excluded because you know, they were all English guys on the beach, period. So, right. you know, right. it shouldn't be denied because it wasn't right. the worst. That's what right. it was. Because there's some period movies that Correct. kind of need so, to stay, you know, yeah. true to their authenticity. Exactly. So in that case, there are other ways to qualify and not be excluded. So, yeah, right. it was really designed to, to get the industry's attention and create a checklist for filmmakers to and studios and everyone in the food chain um, to kind of be attentive to it. Great. Well, we're looking forward to see how that's going to all work out. Hopefully, yeah. we'll make a, a gateway for other artists. Right. Now, I know you have been a mentor to many people and many artists. I was just interested in who, who has been your mentor? Who has been a collaborator or, or a mentor, more importantly, for you? Um, um, I, I've been very fortunate, uh, as I said, to have been given uh, a number of, of opportunities uh, by people I worked for, um, or worked with, or knew. Um, look, I, I would say uh, Peter Chernin, who who um, started out actually at the very birth of the of the Fox Network, but eventually took over the studio and eventually took all of News Corporation with all of star tv and sky and all of that. anyway he was the president of news corporation and and uh, and ran it for rupert uh for rupert murdoch um right and he i worked for him for 20 years um and uh he was an incredible mentor gave me many opportunities is now i said to him oh so when i left fox and he left fox, he left fox about a year before me and then i left fox and I said, oh, this is great. Now I don't have to kiss your ass anymore. We just <laughs> and we are. We're really close friends. Um, and he's an incredibly bright and lovely human being um, in every respect. Uh, so I think Peter is, I think, uh, is a, a, has been a mentor. But there are mentors outside the company. I've been very close to Jeffrey Katzenberg for many years, become friends with Bob Iger. I mean, these are you know, Brian Grazer, people like that, um, who I can generally, and I even hesitate sometimes when I realize that I was, you know, they're close friends. Yeah. Um, and they're people that you can say, what do you think about this? And, you know, you'll hear their perspectives. And I think um, when it comes to uh, guidance on what to do, Mm. Um, there are a number of people. I mean, my wife is a great sounding board. Anne is mm -hmm. incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, mentors, I would say Peter Chernin, uh, friends and advisors, you know, those are just a few. Right. Um, but in terms of um, where the business is going and where the industry is going, it always comes back to the audience. It always comes back to staying in touch on social media. Uh, even though I don't have time to participate, but I read a lot of it and see what other people are saying and what they're thinking and 
you know, what trends are in, in, uh, in film, in pop culture, in talent, flavor of the week, in books, um, and then ultimately in, um, in research and feedback. Uh, of course, business analysis, but research and feedback on what movies are working, why they're working, why the movie we're making is working or not making. So, or not working. So, um, yeah, you get all these inputs. Um, but, you know, that goes back to what we were saying earlier. You need to look externally and just, you know, your passion drives you to do the best and make the best choices you can. But you need to look around you and say, where is, where is the world going? What are kids thinking? Where's culture going? You know, where is the audience going to be? And not today, because, you know, by the time you start this movie and put it in, and put it in theaters, it's two years, sometimes right. much longer. Exactly. Yes. So, you know, yes. There's that. Well, I, I got a couple of questions um, just uh, that people have been posting, and I'm just going to throw one out. Uh, one is uh, from Luis Anastas in LA. What film are you most proud of shepherding? Uh, I think I know, but I'm not going to say it. I want to see. I would still have to say Titanic, which. Oh. Um, I was going to say I Walk the know. Line. <laughs> huh? I was going to say Walk the Line. <laughs> well, that was one of them. That's the other thing I was going to say is there's so many that you're so proud to have been a part of. You know, you know about shepherding. I mean, yes, I did advocate very aggressively um, you know, with, with Jim Mangold. That basically, it was interesting because it was like, really, do we want to do this? Basically, a country music star with a drug habit. Who would <laughs> and two things changed it, which were, one, the great executive that worked for me at the time, Elizabeth Gabler, um, who, who said, this isn't about you know, a musician. This is a 10 year unrequited love romance, right? Yes. Uh, and that's the story. Yes. So, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. And then, oh, I'm trying to remember his name, his great music uh, supervisor came in and, and basically laid out, you know, the whole, the, the start of the movie, which was Sun Records and the birth of rock and roll. So it was, the the way in there's a good example the way in was 10 years of a love affair that wasn't happening and finally did happen and and sustaining that love over that period of, of time while making great music and taking a lot of drugs um, <laughs> yeah um, and our but, fellow greek shot it obviously but, Faden, papa yeah, michael. Faden, papa michael who we've worked with many times with yes um uh, with Alexander Payne is another one. Um, but I, I guess Titanic in the sense that um, uh, when it first came up, it was, wait a second, we've seen this movie three times. Everybody knows how it ends. Where are we <laughs> Everybody dies. <laughs> Everybody dies. And it was a massive budget. Um, and why is it interesting? Well, because it's, you know, Romeo and Juliet on a sinking ship. Um, was that oh. the pitch? Was that the pitch, Romeo and Juliet? Not right. Really. He didn't use it that way, but yeah, that's because... what I mean. But that's a distilled pitch. It, it, is. Say, it is. It is. It's Romeo and Juliet on Sunday. Absolutely. Oh, okay. And Leo wasn't Leo then, by the way. Oh, we had cool. made, uh, speaking of Romeo and Juliet, we had made Romeo. Oh, <laughs> he had to go on forever. The other one, Moulin Rouge, without any question. Oh, yeah. Moulin Rouge. Um, was so not, or, and, and, and Romeo and Juliet, both Baz Luhrmann movies. Yes. When they brought us Romeo and Juliet, um, I, you know, they had a, they had this, uh, I said, well, wait a second. It's set contemporary, but in Shakespearean prose. Right. Right. So it's, uh, how's that going to work? <laughs> and then Baz, Baz had this production design book. Oh, and there were chrome guns and Dolce Cabana clothes and all of these surreal, brilliant. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Life it's amazing. one of my top three movies. And you go, oh, Phenomenal. okay, I get it. 
this is going to be really special. Exquisite. And there's an example of something that in the hands of many other people would have been a dopey idea. Absolutely. Baz Absolutely. was, uh, and CM, his wife, was an extraordinary production designer, probably, obviously, multiple Academy Awards, um, one of the very best in the world. Um, I don't know. So there's a lot of favorite movies. There's a lot. Well, good. Um, I think we're almost coming close to an end. Maybe pick one more question. Um, what What do you feel um, the film Greek the Greek film industry is uh, is uh, is doing? Or, or better, I have a better question. How do you feel? This is our fourteenth year. Do you remember the day that me and Ersi came to your office yeah. and we kind of said, "This is what we want to do, Jim," yeah. <laughs> and you said, "More power to you." Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, because I, you know, obviously putting on a festival and you guys have been, I say it every year when, if I, when I do appear at the festival, I go every year and sometimes you guys think of some gift to, to you know, honor to give me or some, <laughs> you know, always figure out a way for me, but I'm happy to be involved. But I, I, uh, I've really thought you and Ursi have done an extra, and everyone involved, done an extraordinary job uh, with this festival, keeping it alive. It's not easy. It's not cheap. I know. Many times we've looked to the Ministry of Culture and others to, you know, be generous. They've had their issues sometimes. Um, and, and the fact that you've been able to do it and, and gather together all these voices from, especially obviously from Greece or from Greeks, um, is, a, is a tremendous testament to you guys and to everybody who's worked so hard to make this happen. So, yeah, I, I you know. Yeah, and Eric yeah, Topodis, who is, who is, you know, running the festival now just beautifully and making adjustments to make all of it happen. But um, it's, it's hard. And I think a lot of people don't know that ethnic film festivals in Los Angeles, first of all, there are so many. Right. And when we first started, they said, well, you'll, we'll give you two, three years. That's how long they last. And here we are on our 14th year yeah. and uh, I'm very proud of it. And I'm very proud to, to you and our entire advisory board who have always been there for us. Um, it's uh, very, very special. Well, Greeks tend to stick together better than a lot. Not to say that all cultures and ethnicities, you know, don't love each other and care for each other. But I just think Greeks are different. They're just, yeah, they uh, tend to work harder about staying together. And your favorite Greek movie? <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> I know you uh, like it. Rembetico, which I ended up doing the subtitles for. It's still one of my favorite movies. And I know, you know, it's ancient history to a lot of people. Really? Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, it, it, well, because I was a blues guitarist. And oh, uh, yes. when I discovered Rembetico, and I realized it was the same the same themes as american blues the same social origins which is mm. people being displaced from one place and being put in another place in the middle of poverty and urban congestion mm. you know so when the catastrophe happened and everybody came they came with the clothes on their back and hashish many of them <laughs> and they created this incredible music and right. i'm reading about this and reading about um this woman who was married to uh, Jerry Wexler uh, making a Greek film about taking two things, which I was very close to, American blues and the Rebetica and putting them together in a movie. And I thought, okay, I gotta get involved somehow. Right. And I was, no, I was just a young lawyer there at the time. But, yeah, uh, and you, did, you said you did the subtitles? Yeah, yeah, because the sub well, I didn't do the subtitles, I fixed the subtitles. Oh, okay. They were a little wonky. And then, um, uh, what was the film about um, the Politas a few years ago about Politico, Politiki Cusina? Politiki Cusina, yeah. yeah. You know, look, I don't, I, I, I there's a lot I of things that we've seen in the festival and you know, I'm probably forgetting some of them. The, the, the other one that was two years ago, um, I won't remember the title. I, I can see the film in my head, but you know, those are the films that have, that have stayed with me over the years. And yeah, maybe, well, I know you always want to see the films when we have them at the festival and we always send you 
um, well, as I'd many be, as I'd we can. Expecting somebody, I'm sure. If I, you know, yes. Uh, all right. Well, I know uh, you need to get to work and start making some films, <laughs> and we need to also move on. And right. we just so much want to thank you for making time to uh, to speak to us and to almost ninety plus people that showed up. Wow! Uh, from all over the world. Um, again, you're a treasure to our community. And it means a lot to us that you're part of us. And when we look at you, we aspire to be better and to do well. I so. guess the last thing I would say to the filmmakers in the group is, you know, um, if you wanted a profession of certainty, you should be looking someplace else. If you want a profession built on putting your passion in front of a lot of people, never get this urge just keep making your art keep making films try and make things that you can convince other people to pay for which is part of it um but never stop believing in yourself and in your art and in the ultimate outcome and sooner or later it works thank you all right bye, bye. Yeah. 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 So, bye yeah thank you for the beautiful conversation and thank you for being Part of our board of advisors. Okay. Well, my and, pleasure. All right. See you and, later. Bye. And let's turn it to our audience. I want to remind you to join us uh, tomorrow for our final masterclass uh, with Nia Vardalos. It's uh, our usual time at 11, not like today, and 9 for Greeks uh, and make the adjustments from for forever, from wherever you are around the globe. Again, again thank you so much for moderating this lovely discussion and uh, helping us along the way to put this uh, up. So, see you all tomorrow, and you have more days to watch the film, so don't forget to, uh, don't miss out on any of the films offered, because I know many times it's hard to find. Bye, Gedeki. Gracias.